Good morning. I am Lina Khabarani, the Chief Executive Officer of Stambik Bank, Zambia. It's my first time on the webinar series, the Anakazi webinar series, and it's a very privilege to be having Jimmy Khan, the CEO of Lafarge Zambia, as my guest this morning. And this morning we'll be talking about how COVID-19 has impacted us as large corporates in Zambia, and more importantly, how it's impacted our customers. And in our conversations, we'll also discuss how we feel our customers should be reacting to um, COVID-19 going forward. Good morning, Jimmy. Good morning, Lena. Yeah. You and I have been talking over the phone for quite some time, and it's actually a pleasure for me to be seeing you in life this morning. It and good. I, it's good to see that you're doing very well and looking very healthy. Thank you. Jimmy, thank you very much for agreeing to be with us on the Anakazi series. Um, it's a series of webinars that we've had for quite some time, and we've covered very multiple of co um, conversations and topics ranging from compliance into the various products that we have as a bank. And I think this morning's conversation will be very interesting to our listeners. Great. No, thank you for having. Uh, th yeah. Thank you for having me here, Lena. It's a pleasure. It's Absolutely. A pleasure. As you may imagine, um, in a time like this, part of the reason, just to give you some background of, of why we're having the webinar series, is that communication is key. And any form of communication, I think, will be most appreciated by our stakeholders, by our customers, and more importantly, communication that can add value to, to what our customers um, are seeing. So, Jimmy, the COVID-19 has impacted many organizations around the world. And it's, I'll be very interested in knowing how it has impact on Lafarge Zambia um, in the recent past. Sure. Okay. L Lena, first, thank you for, for hosting us here and, and creating this, uh, this forum for us to discuss. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think communication is paramount uh, in these times, uh, especially by us, those of us leading our organizations. Uh, we need to be transparent. We need to talk more about these issues. So first, you, you know, Lena, before we get into the details, I... I have to, I really want us to emphasize that COVID-19 is real. Mm -hmm. I still go to certain communities and certain areas where people have the question, Jimmy, is this real? Is it really happening? Is this an issue that we need to be concerned about? And, uh, and I know you agree with me. I think we can't emphasize enough. It's real. Mm -hmm. It's here. Mm -hmm. It's affecting us. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to be conscious of it. It doesn't mean we have to stop our lives, mm -hmm. but we have to be careful. We have to do the masks the social distancing as you and I are doing right now, um, washing of hands, using sanitizer, uh, you know, even in our homes with our families and, and guests and close members, we still have to be careful. Um, uh, it's been, um, you know, it's been a life-changing event for, for, the, for the planet. Um, and I think we need to accept the reality that it's here. So I think that's the first thing for me that's been really critical for us to communicate in our organization. Um, uh, because when you start to see things go back to normal, you start to get comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's such human nature just mm -hmm. to get relaxed. Mm -hmm. um, so, so first for me, Lena, it's just to emphasize the fact that it's real, it's here, and we have to be careful. Absolutely. Um, now on the organization, it's, it's, th there's a lot of aspects to it. So overall, I have to admit that Lafar Zambia, we're doing okay. We're getting through it. We're doing well. There were some digital initiatives, Lena, that we'd started last year just to be proactive with our customers. Um, and, and through this whole tragedy, this, this, this terrible COVID-19 pandemic, there has been the silver lining that we've kind of accelerated and put a lot more effort into some of the technology solutions that we had, the customer-facing interfaces that we were putting in place, um, just the level of interaction with our customers. Um, while, while this pandemic is a, is a terrible tragedy, uh, it d has forced us to think out of the box. Um, and, and change can be a bit painful. Yeah. Uh, it's not always easy for us, especially in industry like uh, cement. We've been in Zambia 70 years. Yeah. Alina and we've been doing the same exact thing every year for 70 years. So you've, you've become experts at it then? We've become experts <laughs> at the status quo. Yeah. So, you know, we've got a thousand employees. We're, we're a large manufacturing organization and change is not easy. But I think this COVID-19 has forced us to deal with some very difficult realities. First, with us personally as individuals and also as a business. So I think there's probably 
three main areas where it's affected us, Lena. So there's one side from just the people side, then there's the operation side, and there's what you mentioned, the customer side. Um, Lena, I know you drive a Toyota, for example. Absolutely. Uh, our cement plants are big, but I like to compare them to like a, just a vehicle, like an engine. Uh, while our cement plants are very complex, but you have to do maintenance, you have to take care of it just like you have to take care of your car. So one difficulty we've had in operations is our supply chains have been dramatically impacted. So all of our spare parts come from abroad, uh, from Europe, from North Africa, from, from China, from, from Asia, and global supply chains have been impacted. So for example, for 70 years, when you have like a liner failure, you order the liner, it takes two months to come, you change it and you continue. All of that's changed. So when you've got three generations of engineers, engineers doing the same thing and suddenly you're telling them, wait, you have to redo something different, it's traumatic. Mm -hmm. It's traumatic. You have to relearn the processes, redo your maintenance planning, your logistics planning, uh, your schedules. We call it a, a kill and shutdown, a KSD. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest thing we do every year. Mm -hmm. It takes almost six months of planning. Lena, well, you know, that's suddenly becoming 18 months. Oh. So that's been very traumatic for us. But luckily we have the best engineers. Uh, and I've got some cool stories I'd like to share with you as we have this discussion. Um, so the operational side is in a good place, but requiring two to three times more planning. But luckily, we've got the best engineers, and I'm very proud of our team at Lafarge, so who are good there. Um, the people side, that's been tough. So, uh, you know, I know you've worked abroad, and, and I'm from the U.S., so we're used to working from home. We have these, like, uh, Internet solutions and technological solutions to work from home hasn't really been a staple for us in Zambia, I have to admit. Mm -hmm. So this is some of the positive stuff that COVID-19 has forced us mm -hmm. to create these working from home solutions. Um, uh, but we had difficulties in like load shedding. So you have an employee working from home, they lose power, what do they do? Mm -hmm. How do they join the meeting? How do they uh, get in contact with you? They lose their router, their desktop. So it's really forced us to start thinking of Kind of out-of-the-box solutions, like do we start providing inverters, generators, just laptops? For your employees, yeah. For your employees. Do they just use mobile phones? Mm. Should we, I mean, imagine going away from laptops and just using mobile phones. Mm. Because they have batteries, they last for 12 to 14 hours a day. You can charge them at night or anytime you do have power. So, so that's been a, a big change for our staff. We've got about 250 people working from home. Um, and then finally, customers. Cement, uh, it, it's not like an FMCG. It's not like going to a, a shop ride or, or even coming to a beautiful Stanbic branch. Um, it's a bit of a rough business. You go to a market, it's crowded, it's dusty. Um, so so we've, we've done two solutions, Lena, for customers. Uh, and, and they've, I have to admit, they've been adopted very well. Uh, I know Stanbic has a great app. Uh, as a customer, I use it. Uh, so we're not that advanced, but we do have an app now for our retailers, um, so these are the bigger stores like Briozzi, Sakaza, ET Blocks, where they can access their entire account, put an order in for the cement, mm. and this is very non-traditional for us. They're used to calling somebody or picking up the phone, so this has been adopted very well. So almost 50% of our orders now are going through this retail app. Really? It's within months, mm. within three or four months, oh. it's dramatically increased. Mm. And when you're selling about 1.2 million bags of cement a month. That's a lot of orders yeah. to, to go through this app. And second, we've partnered with a local uh, Zambian company, Afro Delivery. I think I was mentioning this yes, to you Yes, you did. Yes, ago. yes, you did, actually. And, and it's really simple. It's actually a food application. It was never meant to handle <laughs> products <laughs> like cement. And I remember when we went to the CEO of Afro Delivery and said, hey, we'd like to put cement on your <laughs> app. And you know, he looked at me a little bit funny, and I... You know, I said, you want to try it? What do you think? <laughs> and he goes, okay, let's see. We, we'll have to reprogram some things. We'll have to create a new interface, but let's try it. Mm. And, 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 and Lena, we're delivering cement to customers within 90 minutes now. Wow. And it's also been adopted very well. I think we've, we had a target to do 500 to 1,000 bags a month. We're doing about 500 bags every three to four days. So it's really been adopted well. People are accepting it. It's, uh, so we're happy to see that.
Fantastic. So I think those are probably the three levels that we've been. No, very interesting. I never thought um, um, cement as a product could be actually distributed digitally. So it's very, it's very interesting that what digital can do, digital innovation can do. It's really helped us think. Yeah. Have you experienced some kind of similar changes in, in Stanbake with COVID-19 coming or? Oh yes, oh yes, Jimmy, um, absolutely. Um, um, I think banking, um, as you'd imagine, is probably right at the nucleus of any economy. Absolutely. Meaning that if anything, if there's any chill in the economy, we tend to feel the cold first. Clear. And we have been impacted in quite a number of ways, and I think very similar to yours, in that we had to deal with the customer issue. Mm -hmm. We also had internal issues with respect to stuff. Not so much operational because we've also really been a digital business for so long and there's very l limited supplies that come into the business. But having said that, we've got vendors as well that we need to depend on. On the staffing side, um, the first and most important thing that we needed to consider was the safety protocols right. of ensuring that we maintain and adhere to the highest levels of pro health protocols in the business, hygiene in the business at all. So with respect to that, like most businesses have done, we had to decongest our business in our offices in most of our premises. And we have up to 33 or 35% of our staff actually working from home. This in itself also brought um, in similar challenges as well um, to our staff working from mm -hmm. home. The, the most prominent challenge for us being a commercial bank is, is cybersecurity. Because now oh. you are now basically saying to our staff members that you need to start working remotely. But working remotely effectively means being able to dial into the banking platform right. and be able to access information that, as you know, as a bank is highly confidential and very sensitive. So working from home then meant that um, incidents or the high risk mm -hmm. of cybersecurity suddenly heightened, which means that we needed to ensure that we provide adequate security for people working from home, the appropriate signing ins and all of that to happen. So that's the most um, critical thing that we needed to deal with. But so far, I must admit that mm -hmm. it's been quite um, smooth so, so much. But you know, cybersecurity, Jimmy, uh -huh. you only know what you know today. Um, the, 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 the fraudsters are out there working twice as hard as you are You're to right. break into your system. You're right. Um, so that has been fairly well done. But the second challenge is very similar to what you said, which is power. Um, the inconsistency and unreliable power that we've had. Now you have to rely on, on, on a third vendor, which is now electricity providers. And that has been very disruptive. And so has also been the limited um, bandwidth um, in terms of internet oh, capability. <laughs> that's a big problem, yeah. Lida. Um, That's a big and, problem. and we tend to to carry large files. We need to we tend to carry quite a lot of information, and mm -hmm. that instability also created a big problem for us. And therein also emerged another cost that we had not anticipated: um, a cost of having to provide um, subsidies for mm -hmm. staff for electricity support. Same here. Uh, we needed to provide subsidies for Same our staff here. members for things like bundles that we had not pro previously provided for. Mm. But all in all, really, it was really for staff purposes to ensuring that they can actually settle, settle and working from home. There's no doubt that it was difficult. Mm -hmm. Initially, you're suddenly having to work in an environment that um, you have to share with your family. Some of our staff members have very young kids. <laughs> yeah, and um, as you're in a meeting, you'll see a little um, boy coming over Run, to daddy right to by. talk to daddy. So <laughs> it's, it's been quite challenging, but I think, um, and, and not just challenging, but also unnerving. Unnerving in the sense that um, people are now having to find reason to wake up in the morning and actually work. Mm. And, and, and naturally what that means is that do I have a secure job? I'm not at the office, right. but I'm earning a salary at the same time. Does it mean that I'm easily dispensable? And we needed to go through that process of saying, no, no, you're working from home because that's the new way of doing something. You're just as important to the business as you were before. So that kind of psychological support was important mm -hmm. to provide to our staff. Um, the second element is, is exactly the same as yours with our customers. Interestingly, even with the advent of um, digitizing and technology and innovation and all that, yeah. a lot of our customers still prefer to have physical banking relationships in contact relationships. So it's traditional, a bit like cement then? Absolutely. Okay. So you want customers prefer to still go into the branch, mm -hmm. deposit money over the counter, and then that wow. gives them some form of security that I've actually provided um, 
um, money to the bank and I've done it. You know, they don't trust our, our um, deposit machines. They don't trust our ATMs. Wow. They prefer to do okay. it to the account. And that's actually the reason why you still find queues in the banks, in the banking halls. You find queues in the banking halls because people prefer to withdraw mm -hmm. and actually make deposits over the counter. But we've been able to deploy and actually push quite a number of our customers into the digital um, platform. And thankfully, as well as Stanbic Bank, we've been in the forefront of investing in innovation and digitizing. And that has really started to really start to, to give the returns that it was um, intended to do because quite a lot of our customers are on it. But again, you know, pushing our customers into the digital network mm -hmm. then brings in another element. And the other element is that you then need to have the, the system stable and secure. Yeah. And the stability of the system now, yeah. the digital system now depends on other vendors as well. You're so right. it's brought in quite a, a, another challenge as well to us. Um, the third point as well with respect to customers is customers are also under a lot of stress. So when, um, when uh, businesses are closed, when restaurants are closed, when there's very little transactability or transacting out there, what it then means is that it's not just us as a bank feeling it, it means our customers are feeling it. So our customers' like business activities have reduced quite, quite significantly. And I'll give a bit more detail of how we're responding to that as we go on with our conversation. So have we been impacted? Definitely. You have. You have. Yeah, Jimmy... The thought I also wanted to pick your mind on is, is what do you think life is going to look like post-COVID? You know, Lena, probably just like you, I, I literally, when I'm at home, it's quiet, I'm by myself, I spend a lot of time thinking about this. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I want to do justice and guide our organization and our people in the right direction. And I think in the beginning, even me, there was some resistance yeah. that this is just a, a flu. Everything's going to be fine, mm. and we're going to go back to normal. Mm. I think that was probably in the first few weeks, mm. when it was largely probably in Europe. I think Africa hadn't been affected. America had really not even had any cases. China was kind of winding down, and Europe was, you know, ballooning a little bit. And it felt like something you'd see on TV just far away. But I think, Lena, with what's happening in, in North America with the second wave in, in China, with, with Europe still not stabilized and our numbers in Africa rising dramatically. I, I think we've come to terms with the fact probably about a month, month and a half, very recently, just six weeks ago, that, that we kind of get stuck in what normal is mm. and we kind of create these preconceived notions and we have to break that, Absolutely. especially in an old industrial business like cement. Mm. But you know, I think banking is very similar. Very similar. When you talked about your customers, Lena, when they have to come in, yeah. that really resonated mm. with me because mm. that's what we deal with. Mm. It's just difficult to break those habits. Mm. It's so ingrained in how that relationship is, it's difficult to change. Mm. But we've been focusing a lot on that, Lena, communicating very frequently with our teams. It's not going to be the same. It's Absolutely. just not There's going to no be way. the same. Mm. And the sooner we accept that, the sooner we come to that reality is how we're going to get out of this in a very positive way. And I think a lot of it's about mindset. It's, Lena, we still have social issues where this weekend we went to somebody's home who had an ill family member. So I went and some of our staff went and we were the only ones wearing face masks, for example, oh, Lena. Yeah. We were the only ones wearing face masks. And we even felt a little bit of stigma that they were looking at us that, why are you coming to our home With wearing masks? masks? Yeah. Now, that's a very small version, but this is the change I'm talking about, yeah, that we need yeah. to kind of come to terms with the fact that things are going to be different. We need to accept a different operating model in our personal lives and our business lives. So, Lena, all the planning that we're doing, those three factors that I mentioned internally from a manufacturing perspective, from an employee perspective, like working from home, uh, and a customer perspective, a lot less face-to-face -face interaction, that's going to be the new norm for us. Mm. And we need to create mechanisms to support mm. that new reality. Absolutely. Even the benefits that we offer, Lena, for example, the benefits that we've historically offered employees have been for employees working at the office. So how can we make it easier? We'll pay for your fuel, mm. we'll give you a car. Mm. But if you don't have to come to the office anymore... Just give you something else. We need to change that. So it, it's really going to require a paradigm shift, even at a management level, mm. to get away from our traditional thinking of what benefits we're offering, mm. working hours, flexibility, uh, like you mentioned, internet. I mean, Lena, how many meetings have we had 
where the efficiency drops so much because yeah. somebody can't connect. Yeah. You're like, can you hear me? No, no. Can you can you hear me? Switch off your camera. <laughs> Switch off your camera. <laughs> it's just so, Lita. Yeah. I, I think we're in a good place. I think we're changing. I'm, I'm so proud of the Lafarge team. Yeah. They've really stepped up uh, and accepted this new reality, but we're still figuring out what it is. Okay. I think uh, it's going to take a few more months for us to get there. Yeah, interesting. I, I think if I was to just maybe just give our perspective of what we think life will be post-COVID, uh -huh. um, th there's no doubt that um, the economic um, environment will be significantly hurt. Yeah. Uh, we will see... Um, not just um, in Zambia, but globally, a lot of business closure. Um, we can see already in the region that, in, not, not just in the region actually, um, throughout the world, um, air travel is significantly impacted. So we then need to start thinking about where we need to be, um, you know, where capital needs to be going to, particularly right. because that industries that are going, that are traditional businesses are going to be changing quite significantly. So if you talk about how life would be after COVID, now looking at um, some of the property and real estate that we have um, across the country, across the globe, that is actually occupied by people. Um, we suddenly now in Stanbic um, have far fewer people coming to the building sure. um, on a daily basis because of what I mentioned earlier, where we have quite a lot of our staff members going to work remotely. Um, so remote working is going to be a reality. We're going to be introducing flexi hours, as we've said. So with so few people um, coming into into the buildings, we're now starting to think if we really need all this floor space. And, and, and I don't You're believe right. it's Stan Big Bank alone thinking about the, all the floor space that it requires, but it's going to be everybody to say, look, I've got a, a third of everybody of my staff members working from home. Um, do I really need this um, this much space, which is a worry in itself. It's a worry because there's so much capital tied up in, in real course, estate. And we course. need to start rethinking about how do we then use the real estate? Is it going to be used predominantly for office um, operations mm -hmm. or is it going to be now used for actual um, residential accommodation? Because now with more people working from home, yeah. um, you'll need more space at home to provide for your working space. Mm -hmm. And you might just start to see a convergence of of real estate, um, retail real estate starting to be more into um, into into residential. At the working level, um, what we are seeing today is going to be the reality, because it just might be COVID today. Yes. But what COVID has taught us is that the virus spreads because of social interactions and how we communicate with one another, yeah. how much discipline we have, our personal hygiene, and all that. So, in my view. Mm -hmm. Whilst humanity might go through this and yes. find a vaccine, we will learn that another another virus is going to come out and will continue with that mindset. So very similar um, thoughts as well with respect to how um, our lives would look post-COVID. Uh, Jimmy, um, as the old saying goes, um, never waste a crisis. Um, and, right. and I don't know, would you, would, you, yeah. would you believe in that? I mean, is there any opportunities that... Uh, that you see coming out of this um, COVID crisis? Yeah, Lena, uh, you know, I'm going to piggyback off something you said in, in your previous comment. Uh, you know, you started talking about real estate and utilization. Um, I, I called you about this, I think, a month ago. Um, and by the way, thank you. You always call me. You see how we're doing as customers. You always check in, and okay. I really appreciate that. Okay. And there's some value because the last time we spoke, you said, Jimmy, how's business going? And I said, Lena, it's actually going. Cement is selling. We were surprised that we were doing as well as we were, and we had a discussion about that. And, and we've been spending more time with our analysts and looking at it. And what's happening, Lena, is it's, it's some of the things you mentioned about what do you do with space. It doesn't mean that if you're not using it for one purpose, Can you use, it use it for another purpose. Um, so what's happened is, in, in my specific industry, uh, we're seeing that the larger projects, yes, they are stopping. Some of the government-funded projects have been stopping. And we thought that we were going to be in a bit of a crisis. But what we're seeing, Lena, is that individual home builders, people like yourself, people like me, uh, people like the gentleman uh, behind the cameras that are being operated right now, they're sitting at home. They're working in a kind of a flexible situation, but they're looking at what to do with their money. Mm. And maybe some of that disposable income that they'd be using for maybe some kind of social interactions are now being redirected to something solid. Absolutely. Something you can kind of touch and put your hand on. Absolutely. And, and cement is one of those products. Inflation hedging. 
Inflation hedging, mm. absolutely. Mm. It's almost an investment. It is mm. an investment. Mm. It is a solid investment. Uh, so we're seeing that the retail segment of our industry has almost doubled. Mm. Interesting. Um, so, so that's been, I think, not positive per se. It's, of course, sustaining our business. But that started opening our eyes, Lena, that there is opportunity here. Um, not to be from a selfish perspective, but now that we're seeing that maybe bigger projects are going down, what so can we do for side. exactly individual home builders? So, Lena, we've been talking the last month at the office. We're planning on probably releasing a new type of cement. It's called a mortar cement. A mortar cement. A mortar cement. Okay. So you don't use it for structural work, but you use it for your bricklaying. You use it for your oh, finishing products. So it's going to be more affordable mm -hmm. because we need to kind of contribute on some level to the economic difficulties a lot of our customers are having. Is this kind of to complement the losses in the large infrastructure projects? It is, Lina. It's to kind of create almost a new portfolio okay. with what's changing in the market. Okay. So if we're seeing a movement towards retail and individual home builders, let's start producing products that specifically cater to that audience. So again, it's these really smart engineers at the office, far smarter than I am, mm. and I'm very lucky that we have them. But they've come up with these really uh, uh, new ideas on products. So it'll be a lower cost for the end user. Um, it, it'll make it easier to do the work itself. Mm. Uh, it'll reduce their financial burden on construction. Um, and I have to admit, Lena, I think, again, because we're a heavy industrial business, I do think we've neglected our customers. Mm, absolutely. And this COVID-19 or this pandemic has just forced us to rethink and look a little bit outside of the box and start catering more to... to Going back to the base. Going back to the base. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's been positive in that sense. And as they say, the fortune lies at the bottom of the pyramid, isn't it? <sighs> it does. Yeah. It does. And it we does. tend to focus on the top of the pyramid. We need that reminder. Absolutely. Lena, how about yourself? Are, are you seeing also some opportunities from your sector in COVID-19? Yeah, yeah, Jimmy. I mean, we, we as commercial banks, specifically Stanbic Bank, play a very important role in the economy which is to ensure that we distribute capital to where we've, we need it, need it the most. And what we've suddenly seen is that the reallocation of capital is starting to look for new, for new home. Right. The traditional allocation of capital where it was going to is starting to, starting to ask questions, as I said earlier on. Um, retail, um, sorry, real estate is starting mm -hmm. to be questionable and so forth. But there's, because of that, there's an emergence of new industries. You know, there's right. suddenly a big demand for public sector health. You know, there has not been sufficient investment into the, to the public sector oh, health, and we leader. need to really start to investing in the public sector. Yeah. I mean, the reason we, all countries across the, across the world, are really working on flattening the curve mm -hmm. is because there's just not enough beds in hospitals to accommodate everybody. So the, the question then is, shouldn't we be investing in more um, of the health sector? That's certainly an opportunity that we see mm -hmm. that has not been explored. We're seeing um, an increased opportunity in masks. If anybody came to the bank um, three or four years ago and said, I wanted to set up a factory to manufacture masks or sanitizers, we would have said, um, no. Sure, sure. <laughs> of course. <laughs> We're not going to support that. Right. But um, somebody coming in now yeah. and talking about PPEs and masks will say, by all means, we want to support that. So, so the opportunities that we're seeing is really from the emergence of new new sectors that are coming in, and that's where we're starting to redirect a lot of the capital to. But another opportunity that, that we saw, um, um, Jimmy, is that with the border closures, and I think you mentioned the earlier, const the constraints in logistics, yes. um, it, it just suddenly brought to bear or to the reality that there's actually a lot more imported into the country than we're actually exporting. We're exporting very little and importing a lot. So the opportunity then is to say, how do we start to drive the manufacturing sector in Zambia yeah. to start to bridge that gap of what is being important? We need to get to a point where the self-sufficiency in most sectors and mm. most products that we're importing in. Because a lot of the products that we're coming in yeah. can actually be made in Zambia. So as financial institutions, our responsibility is to start to ensuring that capital actually flows to where there's a need. And that need is in ensuring that we close that gap. Admittedly, we can't produce everything in Zambia, right. but certain things we need to be able to produce. That's an opportunity Great that point. I will say to our customers, we need to start looking for that gap. Mm. And financial institutions must support that opportunity. Jimmy, I believe we are running out of time. 
Sure. Um, so what I want to just quickly say yes. is um, talking about um, your culture. How's your culture been impacted? Stuff. So, Lena, the, and, and this is still evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the culture part, how we're relying uh, on corporate partners and friends. For example, something that we never did is now we're partnering much more with Stanbic, mm -hmm. Zambia Breweries, Zambia Sugars, just to assist in the medical field. Mm -hmm. uh, Lena, just recently, I think it was uh, Stanbic, ourselves, and Zambia Breweries, where we donated 100,000 kwacha because we came together to build a local ventilator. Mm -hmm at the University of Zambia. Mm. And I think these initiatives wouldn't have happened previously. Yeah. So I think it's really forcing us first to, to not be as selfish, to kind of start looking a little bit outwards and partnering more uh, with partners. And, and I think that culture of communication, of, of partnership, of thinking outside the box, it's not traditionally part of cement lean. It's just not. Mm. We're a heavy industry. We're mm. self-enclosed. Mm. We usually don't need anybody, mm. and we're reasonably successful globally. Absolutely. So this has really forced us to start partnering more. Like Nina, for example, you mentioned uh, the medical industry. Mm. That clearly there's a deficiency there. Absolutely. There's a shortage. Absolutely. They need some help. Mm. And, you know, we can make products, for example, in cement, with certain uh, benefits that make them uh, resistant to um, mold, mm. make them resistant to... Um, contaminants. So the surface has a certain hydraulic binding property mm. that uh, viruses, illnesses, bacteria simply just don't stay there. Really? On contact, they either die or they just fall off. Really? So we built this kind of product in Mauritius. Mauritius is a very humid country. So we built a specific product there to deal with that kind of environment. And, and I think what's happening here right now, and with what you're talking about reinvesting capital, moving it to different industries, and this is where we can really partner, change how we look at the industry, provide products um, that can really cater to that kind of specific customer base. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So there's a lot of potential there. Absolutely. So I think for us, really, I think from a, a culture perspective, it's, it's really more to say, how do we continue to live our culture as a bank? We yes. want to really promote um, high performance culture. Mm -hmm which in itself is based on quite a number of very important levers like trust, communication, fair, um, just basic sincerity. Mm -hmm. All those tend to work best through physical interaction. They do. I tend they to do. be able to trust you more when I see you mm. and I know that somebody else has picked up something or part of the process that they need to do that. So through that, um, we're certainly seeing some kind of breakages in our communication. People tend to be more comfortable sitting at home. And the only way we could try and keep pushing and upholding mm -hmm. our cultural values is through communication, communication, communication. We have seminars, internal seminars and meetings, all virtual right. and regularly. We force our, our teams to communicate mm -hmm. uh, um, through um, virtual interaction. I believe we are finished. We need to probably wind down. Maybe one last um, parting shot from you, Jimmy. Sure. Given the inflationary environment, given all that we've talked about, and given that you produce and distribute cement, yes. what advice would you give to our customers? Lena, well, you know, it, it's uh, obviously not that I have a bias, but I do sell a specific product. I do want them to support us, invest in us. I do think cement is a, is a reliable product, but on, really on a human level, on a human level, what I've been really talking to about uh, our staff in the office, customers on the road, I have to admit it's not about cement. It's about personal responsibility. Mm. It's about financial understanding, robustness, and, and being a little bit long-term planning. I don't think we do that very well, Lena. Mm. So we did a seminar recently at Lafarge for all employees, starting with the line managers, just on basic financial planning. Mm. How much are you saving? Mm. How, what is your disposable income? Mm. Um, how are you managing the future? And Lena, to be honest, I, I really do think we have some of the smartest people working at Lafarge, uh, but if you talk to a lot of our line managers, there wasn't more than a two-month plan. There wasn't more than a three-month plan. Mm. Uh, so with what we're seeing economically, I still think Zambia is the best place to be. 
I don't mean to speak poorly of any of our neighboring countries. I mean no disrespect, Lena, but Lafarge is in all of our surrounding countries. South Africa, Zimbabwe, Malawi, DRC, Burundi, and great countries, but Zambia is stronger. Absolutely. We're in a better place. We have a brighter future, but it's just important that we get back to the basics that you mentioned and we start going back to those levers of financial responsibility. How do you plan for your family? How do you plan for your future? I think we're going to be just fine. I have, have a, to reiterate. I have a perfect solution for that, which I'll share with you. Please. Financial Fitness Academy. We will give it to all the Fart stuff uh -huh. at a time that I'll announce probably in the next two months or so for really? free. Financial Fitness Academy. Absolutely. We'll take all your entire stuff through it. I'm excited, Lena. Don't tell anybody. Okay. But I'll, I'll be your first customer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be first in line. That is great really? to hear. Yeah, Jimmy. No, thank you very much for your time. I think it's been great. Mm -hmm. But as well, what I want to do is just echo your sentiments that we need to all take this um, COVID um, pandemic very seriously. We need to take personal responsibility for it. Um, our government of Zambia will do its best. It will provide protocols and guidelines, what you should, what you shouldn't be doing, what uh, wearing of masks and hygiene. Correct. But at the end of the day, it's my personal responsibility for taking my own health um, um, safety cautions. Thank you very much. Thank it was you, great Amy. talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Um, a very lengthy, um, very interesting conversation that I've had with Jimmy Khan this, this morning. I hope you also found it very interesting and some of the tips that I think came out of the conversation would be quite worthy of um, exploring further. And thank you very much for your listenership. Have a good morning. Thank you.